Everybody hear me okay? That's better. Hi, I'm Vince Bizdeck, editor of the Gazette. Uh, and I really appreciate you coming here. Thanks to our audience. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to our co-host, KKTV. And thanks to our sponsor, Diversus Health. Um, it's great to have this conversation. I think we're at the leading edge of an effort to do more education about fentanyl and, and what a scary kind of thing, what phenomena it is. Um, a couple of our panelists have said to me, it's the most toxic, dangerous drug they've ever seen in their lives. Um, one pill can kill, one and done for a lot of, for a lot of people. And, and some of the people on our panel have had a direct experience with that phenomena. Um, it's, Colorado has a particularly acute problem with this drug. Uh, in the last year, in 2021, uh, we had the second highest rate of increase in, in fentanyl deaths in the country. So we felt like it's urgent to start talking about this. There's no silver bullet for this, but we think education is one of the best things we can do. And that's why we're here. So with that, I would like to introduce Adam Roberts, the president and CEO of Diversus Health, who's kind enough to sponsor the event tonight. Adam. Thanks, Thanks Vince. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to those um, that have joined us here in person. It's great to see some faces in person. And to the thousands of individuals and families watching from home or wherever you may be, thank you for tuning in to this important discussion on the rise of fentanyl in our communities. My name is Adam Roberts, and I am the president and CEO of Diversus Health, the community mental health center serving El Paso, Park, and Teller counties. I would like to thank the Gazette and KKTV for their efforts in putting this forum together and bringing respected leaders across a variety of sectors to discuss this incredibly important topic. At Diversus Health, our core service, service lines include counseling services, psychiatric services, crisis services, and addiction services. Each day we work with individuals and families struggling with topics like substance use and addiction. The effects of substance use disorders are crippling for so many, and it is our shared responsibility to support individuals and families in their recovery. While supporting a proactive approach around prevention also. I mentioned that I am the president and CEO at Diversus Health, but I am also a father. With the rise we have seen in illicit drugs like fentanyl, I understand the fear that parents may have in worrying about their children and their safety. That only enhances the importance of our conversation today. This is an issue that will require collaboration across different sectors in our communities. And I am humbled that our organization plays a part in confronting this issue with so many other critical institutions. Thank you again to all the panelists uh, for being here today, and thank you once again to the Gazette and KKTV for their efforts in this critical work. Good evening, everyone. My name is Adam Atchison. and I'm the evening anchor at KKTV. I'll be moderating the event tonight. We're glad that you're here. If you are here tonight, I know we got some law enforcement, we have some family members, you're likely very concerned about the impact that fentanyl has had uh, on our community and in our state. Uh, we really want people, parents, families to understand, walk away from this forum with more of a grasp of, of, of how this affects all of us. We're going to spend the next hour moving through a number of different questions related to this that the panelists are going to answer, uh, how the scope of the problem locally, how it got to be a problem, treatment options, challenges law enforcement is facing in curtailing the problem, and the signs uh, that maybe you need to watch for at home, that parents need to watch for. We won't likely be drawing many conclusions tonight, but that's not really the point of the conversation. The point of the conversation is to raise awareness. I'm going to be asking these questions, and I know some of you did submit some questions online, so that'll be a part of this. Some of you also wrote down some questions at the door. That may be directed at one person uh, tonight, but anybody, I want panelists to know, anybody can follow up. I think we've had that individual conversation. Please do. Please be part of that conversation once that question is answered by somebody. We are asking each individual panelist to sort of 
uh, keep their answers short, brief, so that we can we have a lot of ground to cover over the next hour, uh, appropriately so. Uh, so if you can keep those answers to one minute, and then if you have a response, raise your hand, whatever the, might, the case might be, and we'll, we'll get to you for that. And then they'll have time for a wrap-up thought uh, at the end. Sound good? With that, I'm going to introduce the panel. We have, uh, from left to right here, Under Sheriff, El Paso County Under Sheriff Joe Royval. To next to him is Corey Notstein. He is with uh, Colorado Springs School District 11, seeing firsthand really what's happening in our schools uh, with fentanyl and the crisis at hand. Michael Allen, Fourth Judicial District Attorney. Dr. David Steinbrenner, the Chief Medical Officer and Emergency Medical Physician for UC Health Memorial Hospital Central and Memorial Hospital North. And El Paso County Coroner, Dr. Leon Kelly. Next to him, Adrian Vasquez, the interim Colorado Springs Police Chief, who's awaiting City Council confirmation to be the new chief. Next to him, Katie Blickendurfer, the Chief Clinical Officer for Diversus Health, and she's an expert on addiction and counseling. And then last but not least, of course, uh, Colorado Springs Fire Chief Randy Royal. Thanks for being here, all of you. Let's dive right into this. And Dr. Kelly, I want to start with you because we're going to talk about the background here. Your office sent out a news release uh, this afternoon with some very telling statistics. But let's, we're going to get to that in a second. Let's start with what fentanyl is and how it got to be such a problem, particularly with deaths, because you've been sounding the alarm on this since 2018. What do you want people to know? So uh, we have to have some historical context, and, and fentanyl isn't where the opioid crisis begins. It really begins in the 1990s with the, with the rise of prescription opioid addiction. This is now just the latest wave of that same crisis, and unfortunately the most deadly. Fentanyl is in a group of drugs called opioids, which are very powerful painkillers. But what they do is, in addition to numbing pain, they also tell your brain and your brain stem to stop breathing. And so the more potent that drug is, the more powerful, the more toxic, the more dangerous it is to your body. And as we've seen wave after wave, first prescription opiates and then a transition to heroin and now a transition to fentanyl, in 2017, in this community, in El Paso County, we had a total of five fentanyl deaths. Every year since then, the five subsequent years, we have seen a more than doubling of those deaths. Last year, we saw 99 individuals in this community die of fentanyl by accidental drug death. We also had two individuals who ended their life intentionally, two suicides. So we had 101 lives lost to fentanyl. In addition to that, I think what is the most concerning and is what's bringing us here today is that it's not only the scope, the, the, the growth of the deaths, but also the breadth. Who's being involved? And last year, we had five youth die of fentanyl. We had a one-year-old, a five-year-old, a 15-year-old, and two 17-year-olds. And so we're at a point in our community where everyone is being impacted. And so this shift to a younger population is due in, in part to... Uh, it's transitioned to a pill form, which is more easily trafficked and, and ingested. And in fact, when we look at our fentanyl deaths, the average fentanyl death in this community is 12 years younger, is age 35, versus all the other drugs, which the average age is 47. And so it's clear where this is moving. It's to a younger generation, a younger population, earlier in their substance abuse history. And over half, 55% of those fentanyl deaths were in the presence of other drugs, which indicates that that fentanyl is in there um, with the user not knowing that it's there, which is what is, is in many ways driving what we're seeing. But then when we look at where we are today and where we are moving forward, in 2022, thus far a year to date, uh, my office has had 27 fentanyl deaths versus 18 year to date last year. And so last year was a tragic year and we are outpacing it significantly. Already year to date, we've had two minors die of fentanyl. And I think what should be most startling to not only El Paso County, but the surrounding areas is year to date last year, we only had one fentanyl death in the 20 additional counties that El Paso County Coroner's Office serves, because we not only do ours, but we do the surrounding areas. This year, already in those rural counties, we've seen six fentanyl deaths, six times. And so it's not just an urban problem. It's not just um, a long-time substance abuse problem. It's everybody's problem now. Now, you mentioned, too, and you touched on this a second ago, and one of these posters in the room talks about four out of every 10 pills with fentanyl contain a potentially lethal dose. Are you finding when you're seeing those deaths that uh, it's being laced with other drugs? You, you mentioned that. Uh, how much of a problem is that? 
Yeah, it's a very big problem. Uh, like I said, majority of the time, um, that fentanyl is in the presence of other drugs. Um, and even when it's fentanyl alone, it's most often not being sold as fentanyl. It's being sold in forms that look like things like Oxycontin or other prescription drugs. And so the user, the person who's buying, does not know that fentanyl is contained in there. They do not know that they are ingesting what is essentially the most lethal and toxic drug ever released on the streets. Chief Royal, I want to ask you to, uh, your firefighters are often first to the scene when it comes to emergency responders in cases like this. What are you seeing when it comes to the number of cases of overdoses or potential overdoses compared to five, 10 years ago now? We, we've definitely seen a significant increase, uh, both locally and nationally. Uh, it goes right along with what uh, Dr. Kelly was seeing nationally on EM, EMS response in 2021, ending in April. Uh, it had gone up 30, 30% overdose deaths. That does, that's not all total overdose, that's just deaths. And looking into 22, it looks like that's gonna double. So it, it is significant uh, age range as well, 18 to 45 is what we're seeing uh, as far as th those deaths. And um, for us, it, it's a huge impact on our call volume. And uh, one of the national statistics that I saw 1% now of our total call volume is, is overdoses. That may not sound like a lot, but it's huge. That number is huge. Um, those deaths, 100,000 in 21, uh, that's more than we're killed in, uh, you're, you're more likely to die of an accidental fentanyl overdose than you are in a, a car accident. And so again, that just plays those numbers to, to how high they are. Uh, the impact on us on our crews is we, um, we have to be very aggressive which we are all the time, but we have to be very aggressive with how we care for these. And I can talk more about that later. Sure. Under Sheriff Roy Bell, do you feel that you are also seeing an increase in, in, in cases? That, I know your deputies just recently responded to a scene where a life was saved, uh, that they were able to save somebody's life with Narcan, Naloxone. What are you seeing as far as cases go and responses? We are absolutely seeing an increase in those. And I'm glad you mentioned that the happy story. Uh, where we had somebody who potentially could have lost their life due to a fentanyl overdose. And fortunately, our deputies were there in time and able to administer Narcan and save that person's life. But that's only the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. uh, saving that person's life is just the first step into hopefully the recovery and saving that person. We save that person from the initial overdose and potential death, but that person must absolutely receive some type of treatment and follow-up care to ensure that we continue to save that person's life. And that's a community um, engagement and community must come together to ensure that not only once law enforcement intervenes and the people up here intervene, but we continue to provide those services and save that person's life. We're definitely gonna dive into some more of the treatment options and things during the course of this hour. I wanna direct another question though to DA Allen. How many possession cases, we talked about obviously overdose cases, how many possession cases are you seeing compared to ten, five, 10 years ago now? <clears throat> So the, the difficulty with possession cases is that the officer on the street doesn't necessarily have the tools to test the drug when they seize the, the, the substance. And so there's a big delay in how quickly we can file a case. We have to send that substance to a lab that is specifically able to test for fentanyl and do it in a safe way so that the uh, person isn't jeopardizing their own health. And so there's this big delay between the bust and when the case actually gets charged. Um, but it's climbing uh, unbelievably. One thing that I, I wanted to jump in on, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that is the idea that people are being saved by Narcan out on the street. We measure the magnitude of this epidemic on the number of people that have died, but that number could be exponentially higher if it weren't for the people like uh, fire department, sheriff's office, and the police department being out there on the front lines and dealing with this every single day. It's happening every single day that they're saving people. Chief Rural, how, how many times would you guess uh, your crews do some sort of life-saving measure when it comes to that? Well, I, I don't have an exact number, but it's every day. There's, there are some overdoses that they're running on every single day. And mostly, thankfully, they don't end up in, on, on the, the death side mm -hmm. of things. But um, that's reality of what we're dealing with. Absolutely. We have an audience question I want to get to. I'm going to direct this to Interim Chief Vasquez. At a news conference earlier this month, you held up a sugar packet and you were talking about how that little amount, I think it was one gram, right, uh, can kill, can kill 500 people. With that in mind, can you talk a little bit more about how minuscule amount it takes really uh, to be lethal 
And then the question from the audience was, what data exists to help us understand the why behind this pandemic or epidemic, I should say? Sure. Um, so you're right. One sugar packet is typically thought of. It's it's about one gram. And so when you think about that, that's about enough for 500 deaths. Um, so four grams, you know, you you can kill up to 2,000 people. So the why from from a medical perspective is probably better answered by Dr. Kelly. But let me let me talk just about why we're seeing so much fentanyl on the streets. And I can give you just a, an idea of a, a dealer's perspective on why they're pushing so much of this drug. If I'm a, a cartel uh, leader or cartel member in Mexico, I can buy a kilo of fentanyl, pure fentanyl for $2,000, $2,000. That's enough fentanyl at one to two micrograms per unit or per hit to make 500,000 pills. Once I push those pills out, 500,000 pills, an investment of $2,000, I can now bring over to the United States, sell those pills for anywhere from $3 to $8 a pill. And even if I go mid-level, $5 a pill, that's $2.5 million street value on a $2,000 investment. That's why we're seeing the sheer amount of fentanyl on the streets here in Colorado Springs and across the nation because the sheer amount of money that they can make pushing the drug is much more cost effective than any other drug that we're seeing out there. And it's much more lethal. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kelly, did you want to weigh in on that too? Yeah, I mean, it, that, that's exactly right. It, it, when we think of the classic drugs of abuse, like cocaine, heroin, and, and some of these others, they require plants. They require sophisticated growing um, facilities in other countries. And, and our law enforcement and our global partners have done a good job over the years, decades, enforcing that. But this is a drug that can be engineered from nothing um, and created. And, and to, to the point, it then is a massive moneymaker. And it can be trafficked in forms that are much easier to do. It can be masked as other prescription pills. It can be put in backpacks and hidden and mailed through the mail from all over the world and created in one place and then stamped and manufactured in another and distributed in a third. And so unfortunately, it is a moneymaker and, uh, and, and, and there's, a, there's a market for it. And Adam, can I can I add sure. one more thing? One one of the things is it's much more palatable to use. So other opiates like heroin, for example, are oftentimes used intravenous. So they're shooting heroin, and that's a a, a lot of people don't want to stick a needle in their arm or don't want to stick a needle in them. But taking a pill. Uh, to Dr. Kelly's point, thinking it's oxy or some other form uh, uh, or some other drug is much more, it's easier to conceal, it's easier to obtain and, and just hold, and it's easier to use because you can just pop it in your mouth and then you don't know what you're taking. Well, it can be deceiving too. I mean, if you take Absolutely. a look at this, there's as a parent, this concerns me right here, that it can be hidden in candy Absolutely. or what looks like candy. Is that why it's so appealing to younger and why you, Dr. Kelly, may be noticing uh, the, the younger skewing when it comes to cases and deaths? I think that that barrier is gone. Every kid in America has taken an Advil or a Tylenol, right? Um, and then when you look at the very young, the one and the five-year-olds, what do little kids do? When they see a bright blue thing on the carpet. The first thing every kid's going to do is pick that up and put that in their mouth. And so when we have a drug that's that pervasive in the community, eventually young people are going to encounter it. D.A. Allen, I want to ask you along the same lines here, uh, how are people getting this, not necessarily where it's coming from. We'll get to that later in the conversation, but where are people accessing it? They're, <clears throat> they're accessing it through the same sort of drug distribution networks that they've accessed all kinds of drugs. And it's just being added to either pill form, like we've talked about already, we've got pictures over there. You cannot tell the difference between a prescription Percocet and a counterfeit Percocet. And so they think they may be getting Percocet, but it's a uh, Russian roulette situation where they're gonna get a deadly dosage of fentanyl. And then uh, drug dealers are giving it out to, to people. Uh, we've had obviously some high school kids that have uh, obtained this stuff and, and basically died in schools. Uh, we've had very young kids, a two-year-old uh, child that was able to get, get it in a drug den essentially and die. And we're looking into a case like that currently. So they're getting it in the same ways that they've gotten other drugs. It is just much more powerful and much more deadly. And to Dr. Leon Kelly and, and Chief Vasquez's points, uh, it's much more palatable. It's much more attractive. The the poster behind you there, mm -hmm. it looks like gummy bears. It looks like Skittles. It looks like Pez dispenser candy. And we're seeing that now on the coast. It's going to be here in Colorado at some point in the very near future. So this really is an, an opportunity to educate the public so that parents know 
what their children are potentially being exposed to so that we can hopefully save some lives that way. Mr. Notstein, I know that you have dealt with counseling over this type of thing before, and, and it's pertinent to have you weigh in on too when we're talking about younger skewing cases. What are you, how can you, what, what are you seeing when it comes to that? Yeah, well, we've been looking at the Healthy Kids Colorado data that really guides some of what we've been seeing in the past. And when we look at relative to age, I think Dr. Kelly's hitting on this idea that it's becoming younger and younger. We know from our own data samples that 11% of middle school students have already participated in some sort of prescription drug, right? And so if they don't know what they're taking, they're going to be taking something that could be, unfortunately, laced with fentanyl. And then in the high school setting, we're seeing about 17% of those students have already participated in some form of prescription drug use. And if you add that with who has tried marijuana, right, you're already talking about one in three high school students. And, and when you look at middle school, you're talking about about 14%. If that becomes then laced in other substances, all of a sudden you're seeing younger and younger children, students that have potential use, um, whether it be at the home or through their, their peers, uh, gain access to this. And, and it's not to say that uh, this is new. These numbers have been consistent over time. We've seen youth trying drugs and initially trying drugs at younger and younger age, particularly around fifth grade at the onset, and then moving up over time. And so uh, it becomes a really devastating thing when you have high school students that we've been talking about up here all of a sudden try something for the first time because their friends gave it to them, and all of a sudden now they're down, and now we're required medical care, uh, and hopefully we can administer Narcan. We have in our own schools most recently. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to add, the, the point of, of this all, too, is that there is no illicit drug out on the street now that should be considered a safe drug because fentanyl is so easily mixed with these other drugs, as, as Corey was just talking about. So that's got to be the message, right? Every illicit drug you should assume has fentanyl in it at this point, in if, my opinion. If I could add to that. Sure. The, the problem with all of these drugs is they're dose-dependent, right? The effects upon the person is suppressing your breathing and what it does to them is depending on the dose. So these drug dealers do not have command and control of what they're putting in there, really. They think they do, but they don't. And you could have three pills, and the first two that that person's taking, they think, has, it's laced with fentanyl, they don't know what it is, and they get a reasonable dose, reasonable enough, and they survive. And then the third one has a lethal dose. When you talk about a milligram of a drug, it, that's about a thousand micrograms. When I dose fentanyl, the legitimate reasons for pain control in the emergency department for a broken leg or someone coming in with appendicitis, I give an adult 50 to 100 micrograms. So that's 10 to 20 times the dose that somebody might be getting. And mm -hmm. it's so small. So people really don't know what they're getting, even on the drug that they thought they took yesterday that was okay. Let me follow up with you, Dr. Steinberg. Are there are there physical signs that differentiate this drug from others while under the influence or after long-term use? Uh, what does a fentanyl overdose look like? Fentanyl overdose will look like other narcotic overdoses. Um, you know, the person's going to have depressed uh, sensory neuro, so they're just going to become more and more lethargic. And over time, what will happen is their breathing will slow down. And what happens is they primarily get to the point where their breathing slows down too low and slow, two to four times per minute or something like that, so they can't properly oxygenate, oxygenate their brain. Uh, and they don't have the drive there that they can override it because of the narcotic that's in their system affecting the brainstem that we were talking about. Uh, it's a very powerful drug because it affects the euphoria centers in the body. Uh, it, it hits those things that we get natural endorphins that allow us to get pleasure. And so those kind of things, people chase the drug and they go back for that fix again and again. And so what happens is they end up getting that and it's, it slows them down to the point their lips will be blue, they'll be unconscious, unresponsive, not responding. Pinpoint pupils is often the case, but not for every narcotic overdose. Uh, it's just a question of, there, there's really only one thing that anybody can do at that time besides call 911, open the airway and start CPR. They can use Narcan. That's a, something that we really need to get out there ubiquitously everywhere that we can right now because it actually can save lives. Uh, and it's a very uh, quick um, way to get in there and, and just immediately reverse the effects of that fentanyl. How can somebody access that? We'll, we'll get to more of the discussion Absolutely. on Narcan I later. But I, I, do, I am interested since you held it up. Is that something that anybody can get anywhere? Does it have to be prescribed? What is? What well, is there's it? actually a standing order in the state now that not everybody realizes and actually in full disclosure, I hadn't realized until recently, that actually allows somebody to go into a pharmacy that's participating and actually buy the drug without a doctor writing a prescription for it, which I think is a very good step forward. Uh, I think there's something called StopTheClockColorado.org that allows people to look at which pharmacies are participating, and then you can actually go into the pharmacy and buy it. Uh, I think that's a first step. That's a good first step. Okay.
Ms. Blickendorfer, I want to address this question. Do you have local clinics and addiction specialists seen an increase in people seeking treatment for fentanyl overdoses, addiction, in, in, you know, along with the cases that we're seeing? And how so? Yeah, it's hard to determine that that strictly they're seeking out treatment for fentanyl because a lot of times they're not even aware they're taking fentanyl. Um, there is a greater need in this community for both mental health and substance use disorders. And I think it's, it's important to note that a lot of people go to substances like opiates, fentanyl, in order to address um, in an unhealthy way their underlying mental health issues that they're not being treated for. Would you say it's easier, more difficult to treat when it comes to addiction uh, than others? Yes. Um, you know, the withdrawal effects are not lethal from withdrawing from opiates, but it's definitely not a um, pleasant process. And so a lot of people will go back to the drug. So I, as a community, it's important to recognize that um, abstinence is likely not going to be the first line that somebody chooses and that we look at ways to do harm reduction, medication assisted treatment to help taper people off of opiate addictions paired with counseling, potential other medications that could help address the issues. And is that, you're, you're seeing that work? Yes. Yes, there's a there's a significant need for intensive outpatient programming for substance use disorders, as well as a request for sober living and medication assisted treatment. I want to talk a little bit too um, as we move forward about what law enforcement is is facing when addressing this. We we briefly touched on that, but we'll be able to maybe move through all of those that are here in law enforcement and get a little bit better perspective. Under Sheriff Royball, we've been reporting on several cases where people thought they were taking another drug, right? Uh, I believe it happened in Commerce City. There was a case there where multiple people were passed away because of a fentanyl overdose. Uh, does the presence of fentanyl in so many different drugs present unique challenges for law enforcement? It, it absolutely does um, because it can be disguised in, in a variety of drugs. Uh, our officers have to take precautions when they're approaching it. Uh, in my time serving in Metro Vice Narcotics, anytime we had an overdose, we would respond and investigate that, that death as a crime, trying to backtrack the, the supplier, the root cause of where these people receive the drugs, not only to prosecute those people and send it to our district attorney, but to try to trace where that drug was identified. Is it in our schools so we can, we can uh, prevent further deaths? And the, sheriff, the sheriff has a unique um, perspective because we are mandated to operate a jail. So inside our jail, we are now the largest mental health facility in the state, El Paso County is, with over 60% of our people needing some type of mental health uh, intervention. We have a ward dedicated to detoxing people who come in. Uh, we, have, we provide services inside our facility. Um, obviously, it's easier for them to detox because they can't uh, obtain the drugs inside the jail. Uh, we're very um, adamant that we keep it out, and sometimes it finds its way in, and that, that can be very dangerous. Um, people who obtain it on the streets want to try to find it inside our facility. And when there's money to be made, they try to beat our system. So we were not only combating it on the street, but we have to combat it inside our jail as well. Maybe I can have uh, Chief Vasquez also weigh in on that. Sure. Um, so a couple of the other, in addition to what Under Sheriff Roybo had talked about, and, and you, you, you asked this earlier about how kids are getting the drug. Um, and one of the unique challenges for law enforcement right now is that the kids are, we're seeing this severe increase in the use of uh, social media like TikTok, for example, um, to order the drug. So uh, being able to intervene in ways for our kids to not get the drug is very difficult for law enforcement. But additionally, we are generally coming across the drug because of other types of calls for service. So we might be out on a theft or on a domestic violence or something like that. And it's because of these other calls for service that we're actually coming in, in contact with, with the drug or finding out that people have that drug. But even then, as uh, many people have talked about, there's not a good reliable uh, method yet to test it um, on scene. We are finally uh, testing some some strips right now that we're, we're having some good success in for our law enforcement officers. But to DA Allen's folks, uh, issues with our inability to uh, provide field tests, we have to wait. We can't make arrests to hold people accountable immediately uh, because of that lack of field testing. Uh, we are getting there, and I think we have some good potential for that uh, in the things that we're looking at right now. So I think that'll help us out. DA Allen, did you want to comment on that too? Sorry. The challenge with uh, the issue that Chief Vasquez just mentioned about 
uh, the inability to test on scene. What the challenge from the prosecution perspective is, is that if we charge that without a test, that starts the speedy trial clock. And then we may not get lab testing done before that case gets to a trial posture and then would cause us to then have to dismiss a case. So we have to be very thoughtful about how we're working with the police department or the sheriff's office, the lab, to get these testing uh, requests done and then being able to come through on the prosecution side of things. It's, it's a challenge because there's not a reliable way to test on the street. And if you think about the pill uh, version of fentanyl, we're not seeing necessarily pure fentanyl on the street. We're seeing it mixed with other mm -hmm. things, right? And so the whatever instrument is used to test on the street has to be able to decipher what's in that potentially a pill or something like that. This this question came from the audience. Since we're talking about the testing, uh, you know, aspect of all of this, do you think it's a good idea to make test strips be made commonly available? And and this audience member asks, is it just green lighting the use of other drugs, uh, or ones laced with you know, undetectable amounts of fentanyl. I, you're looking at me, Adam. Yeah, so sure. I, I you you're <laughs> take me. that question for me. Uh, I, I think that that's a, in some respects, a double-edged sword, right? If you're putting a bunch of test strips out, you're also then encouraging people to use it, um, right? So to see if they are getting a lethal dosage or not. Uh, and, and I just think that even though we know that just say no doesn't necessarily work, right? That uh, people that want to use drugs are going to use drugs. Um, but we've got to get the message out that Every single drug on the street today is potentially a deadly dosage of fentanyl. And you're really taking your life in your own hands and playing Russian roulette with what you're popping into your mouth or however else you might want to take this, this particular substance. And that's got to be the message. Yes, we've got to somehow get test strips out so that people can test to see what it is they might have in their possession. But it's really got to be something more than that. And it's got to be a cultural shift. And, and I'm afraid that we're, our, we've got too much of a culturally um, permissive attitude now towards drug use that really has been building for quite a while in Colorado. And, and it started with marijuana, that's one thing, but now we're talking about something that is deadly almost instantaneously. Mr. Nostein, I know you discussed uh, the, the test strip. There were some concerns that you had over that too about detecting it, right? Because of, you know the presence of fentanyl can be, as we mentioned here earlier in the panel, different between two or three pills. Yeah, I definitely think that the test strips have their, their challenges, right? If you're trying to determine if a pill that's that's referenced over there on the diagram has fentanyl in it, how much of that pill are you going to be able to test with a single test strip? And I think that's the challenges we're talking about. Uh, I think more importantly, I think that what we're talking about is like what education can we actually start providing our youth and our families to be able to uh, intervene? Like there are pivotal points in a user's uh, spectrum of use that might be really good for cessation. We talked about harm reduction, but if we're talking about our habitual and dependent users all of a sudden stopping today, mm -hmm. we, we know that's not a reality. What we're really talking about is educating those that are our initial first-time users or the occasional users, and how do we actually get education to the youth? How do we get education to their family about what to look for, how to identify it, where they're buying it from, and how do they intervene? Uh, but we certainly can't do that if there's not good educational materials out there for school-aged children. Much of this material has been written for adults because it was an adult issue. We talked about Dr. Kelly talking about that, that reduction in the usage age or the death age of fentanyl overdoses, and there's not good materials that schools can utilize to educate their children that they're serving uh, and their families, and we're having to create it from scratch, and we're a little bit behind this, but we're having this discussion now to start the educational process. Ms. Blickinger, I know you wanted to weigh in, and I apologize. Go ahead. No, that, that's okay. I agree that there's two different issues here, those longtime users that are not going to quit right away, and you have to focus on the harm reduction. So our community does have a safe needle exchange program that allows people to not just exchange their needles safely, but to be able to test things for whether or not it's laced with fentanyl. Um, and then the other user group, the new users, the ones that um, are experimenting under peer pressure, et cetera, those are the ones that we need to educate and prevent them from even attempting to try a pill or, or get addicted. Let me let me press that just a little bit further. Since we're on this topic of the testing and the you know and the prevention and that, what kinds of things? What else would you suggest that the community needs to do? I know you touched on that earlier. Moving forward, uh, as part of this conversation. 
Yeah, it's important to have open dialogue and transparent conversations about potential drug use and what your children or loved ones may be encountering in the world and openly talk about those things. I think there's a myth that if I talk about it, it may push my kid to seek that out. And I think we should debunk that and um, recognize that those are things that they're going to encounter. And we want to equip our kids with the ability to recognize, hey, here's some risks. Here's how I say no. Here's some peers that are supportive. The peer support model in addiction world is so very important in order to give people allies of people that understand what they're going through and can help them walk on a healthier path. Is that more of a challenge when we see things like candy being, that, that may be disguised as a Skittle uh, that could potentially kill someone? Uh, that's yeah. got to be a concern for parents out there. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, if, if you're a 15 year old and you're struggling and feeling anxious or depressed and your friend says, hey, you know what? Try this pill. It's helped me. I'm going to try it because I don't want to feel anxious and depressed. And so within that conversation that parents need to have, it's what can we help? The, how can we help the kiddo address those underlying issues that are leading them to seek things out to try to give them a high? Let's, Corey, I want to read, you know, readdress this with you too. Uh, what you mentioned harm reduction in the past, the importance of that speaking to kids. What, what are you doing within the school districts to try to bring attention to this problem? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's certainly something we've been dealing with firsthand within our own schools. You've heard some people reference um, students that have overdosed and, inter and how schools have intervened and staff have had to actually intervene alongside law enforcement to administer Narcan. Uh, to save or attempt to save the lives of youth. Uh, the first thing that we did back in, oh, well, a couple of things. One, it's not as easy as you think to get Narcans in, Narcan in school. They're specific. Um, when you're talking about the open script, the, in order for a school to be able to access that, they have to have board policies that, per, that allow for bulk ordering and administration. Uh, and so we've gone through that process back in January. Our board of Education was highly supportive of that. Uh, from there, though, we need to educate staff. This is something that many people don't really understand or know about. So we created a video talking about many of the things that we're talking about right now sent it out to all of our school staff to be able to view this video. And then we turned right around the following week and sent it to the entire school community and said, you need to be aware of what this looks like. Right now, what we're having youth discussion about, and I was just at a high school last week talking with their student council about their opportunity to be advocates in this space. Uh, they're doing interviews and posting it on their own in, sort of in-house news channels. Um, we're, we're launching a fake and fatal campaign, right? We're talking about these fake pills that are fatal. And then how is it that we spread that information? So signage is going out. Uh, later in May, May 12th, we're hosting a panel discussion uh, with our families and our students to be able to attend to that, to, to be able to continue that. But the reality is there's there's lots of other things that still have to happen, and mm -hmm. primarily curriculum-based education within our health curriculum, talking about this and how is it that you can successfully say no, and who are those strong peer groups and where can you turn to for support? Do you think that the conversations will have an effect? I mean, just talking about it, getting it out there more, having those panel discussions? Well, I think you can't, if you don't have any awareness that this could be a, a challenge for you and all of a sudden you take a pill for the first time and then all of a sudden you're down, I think it's going to. I think I think the first thing we, we recognize is that scaring our youth that is not going to be the answer. We saw that years ago, but having honest conversations about what we're going to be able to do and where can you turn for support. I think the other piece of that is is providing mental health services directly in our schools. We know that there's a high level of need for mental health in general. We also know that our youth are using, but how do we have enough substance abuse um, specialists within our system to be able to address this? And so the other thing that we're talking about doing now is can we offer what's well, called a um, certification and addictions uh, specialist to be able to have our staff trained so they do have firsthand skills to be able to address addictions issues because many of our staff don't have those skills now. By the way, that I, I did want to mention that particular question in the path we took there was an audience question. So that was something that people are concerned about, you know, at home about the conversation and, and the next steps. Let me let me backtrack here. It, just ask the DA because I promised you I would I would do this. Where is the fentanyl coming from? Primarily. You touched on this, I think, during a news conference a few weeks back. Yeah, so what we're seeing is that fentanyl is being produced primarily overseas in China, and then it is being shipped to Mexico, as I think Chief Vasquez talked about earlier, and then it's being shipped from Mexico through our southern border and in, then into the United States. Just earlier this week, I know that there was a huge bust in Tucson, Arizona, 
right, on uh, something like 25 pounds of fentanyl pills. We've had seizures here in Colorado Springs, uh, very near to the UCCS campus, 130,000 fentanyl pills seized here in our community. So it is, uh, again, it's flooding through our southern border primarily, but because it is so easily produced, as I think Dr. Kelly talked about, it wouldn't surprise me to start seeing it being produced here in the United States and then cutting out that middleman sort of process from uh, Mexico and China and then just being distributed straight from our own country. Uh, I think that's probably going to happen as we see the rise of fentanyl. And, I, and, and one thing that I'm really impressed by with this, in pa this panel here is this highlights exactly the point of the danger of fentanyl. It is affecting everybody in the community from our schools, uh, from our fire department, to our treatment providers, to our coroner's office, to the DA's office, to parents out on the street. And, you know, obviously I'm on the enforcement side of things. I can't, I, I don't think I've met a parent yet who has said that uh, they would prefer that their loved one maybe gets locked up for a night as opposed to being dead for the rest of their lives, right? And that's really what this is about. This is a life and death situation and we can't stress that enough. And it's impacting, as we're, as we're all talking about, a wide swath of our community. Under Sheriff, you want to touch on any of that as well? Um, the challenge, you know, with where it's coming from and, and how you're regulating that within the community? Um, I, I want to add to what uh, DA Allen, Allen said. We have enforcement units out there, specialized units that are going after the dealers, those dealers who are mixing fentanyl with other narcotics and that are causing these deaths. Um, and how we do it is we, we make contact with the, the users. Now, current legislation has taken some of our teeth away. When we have people we make, we contact and we're ho holding a misdemeanor over them, how are we going to take them to jail? How are we going to hold that over their head to go for that next level of distributor, uh, dealer? Uh, they have taken the teeth away. So the people up here on this panel have reached out to legislatures, and we are pleading with the legislatures to give us that tool back. So we're able to go after those high level distributors, those high level dealers, because as a society, the legislature has really minimized drug use. We, we've done that with marijuana. And back when I was in high school, I won't tell you my age, but it, it was a big deal if somebody had alcohol. Oh, alcohol was taboo and, and oh, it was a big deal. Then it was marijuana. Now marijuana is easily accessible by our kids. Sometimes it's at home. They can go to stores and shops throughout our community to obtain that. Now, with the legislature making possession a misdemeanor, we have no tools to go after those and identify those high-level dealers because not only is it a misdemeanor, we don't take misdemeanors to jail. They get multiple chances before we can actually take them to jail. We've taken law enforcement out of it, and we need that back. If we have possession of felony again, it's automatic jail offense. Now, those people, well, I don't want to go to jail. What can I do to stay out of jail? Well, why don't you work with us, and let's go after that dealer. We don't want the user. We want the dealer, the people who are poisoning our children and our families. Yes. Yeah, can I just add, <clears throat> so every one of the high-profile overdose death cases that we've seen in Colorado over the last several months, we're talking about Commerce City, we're talking about the teens down here, um, other groups that have uh, died from fentanyl, they've all been, uh, you know, we talk about high-level dealers, but every single one of those instances has been less than four grams of fentanyl distrib distributed in those instances. So we're talking about uh, four sugar packets, basically, been involved in each one of these cases, that's a very small amount. Uh, and that, that just highlights how deadly this drug is, right? And, and how prolific it's getting. Now that, that is mentioned in a bill too that's being considered in the, in the state legislature. And you've spoken about that as well. I, would you like to talk more about the current proposal? Yeah, so the current bill that's before the legislature now, and, and it, I expect it's gonna be on the House floor for debate and amendments uh, very soon. But essentially, um, Four grams or less would remain a misdemeanor. I'm advocating that any possession of fentanyl should be a felony. And that's not to punish users or addicts. It's to address the dangerousness of this particular poison. It, that's what we're talking about here is a poison that's killing people. And so if we can take a user and force them into treatment with a felony charge and then maybe expunge it down the road or something like that, I'm all for that. Uh, the other part of this is that in the bill um, ties distribution resulting in death to the weight of the fentanyl distributed, that needs to change. That's focusing on the drug instead of the life that's lost. 
And so anybody that is distributing fentanyl and kills somebody with that fentanyl, that should be a mandatory prison sentence in my opinion. The law as we currently have it, uh, very weak on, on punishing a fentanyl distribution death case. We can't use a first degree murder charge or something like that for it. Uh, the closest we could get to a manslaughter and that's a probation eligible offense. Dealers who kill people should not have the option of probation. They should go to prison and they should go to prison for a long time. Luckily, we have a really good partnership with our federal partners, uh, and we've taken all of our distribution death cases to the federal system where they have a mandatory 20 years to life sentence for distribution resulting in death. That's a great partnership and a great tool that we have in our toolbox, and it's really resulting from our relationships with those folks. And then the other provision that I think needs to come out of the bill is what they call the Good Samaritan provision, and they're really comparing drug dealers who kill somebody to a Good Samaritan which to me on its face is, is laughable at best. But if somebody uh, in, under this provision, if a dealer distributes fentanyl and it leads to somebody dying, as long as that dealer stays on scene, calls the cops, answers some questions, they would be immune from prosecution for the distribution and the death of that person. That to me is perplexing. We're talking about people's lives being taken by this drug. And the people that are putting it on the streets and causing these deaths should be held accountable and should go to prison in my opinion. Uh, the counterpoint that supporters have said of, the, of that bill that, you know, making the four grams or more, well, anything under four grams, a felony level, uh, punishes those who may be seeking help for addiction or treatment. What's your viewpoint on that? Well, like I said just a moment ago about all the high profile overdose death situations have all been in that four grams or less scenario. So the dealers in those cases under this bill, if it was passed today, would be probation eligible, potentially would even be immune from prosecution. And, and again, it doesn't take much to kill somebody with this stuff, right? And so we really need to recognize how dangerous this stuff is and punish the drug, not necessarily the addict. Get the addict into the treatment programs, right? And sometimes you need to put somebody in jail to force them into a treatment program. That's the reality of it from my, my perspective. There's a misnomer out there or, or a, uh, a myth that the prisons were full of people that were just drug users. That is not the case on the state side. That comes from federal um, legislation. Federally, uh, if people were in possession of crack cocaine and that kind of thing, they would go to prison. The state side, I have never in my 17 years as a prosecutor put a first time drug user in prison. That does not happen. It requires them to commit multiple offenses or to violate their probation multiple times and then earn a way into prison. On a first time offense, we don't send those people to prison, we're getting them into treatment. And sometimes it requires that carrot and stick approach to get them into that treatment program and hopefully save their lives. Hmm. Would anybody else wanna weigh in on that? Uh, I would just say it is a complex problem. It needs a complex solution. So the uh, a lot of the folks who are users are also dealing it, I think, too. Although I'd have to defer to these folks who are actually arresting them to find out for sure. But I know from the folks who treat addiction that that's often the case that people slip into that. So from the medical side of things, we wanna make sure that we tackle the demand side of it, too. And I think that's the addiction. I mean, this did not grow over the last couple of years to Dr. Kelly's point, And I really appreciate all that Dr. Kelly's done over the years to help us with this. This actually grew from many, many years of you know, increased use of opiates and not understanding the true potential of making people physically dependent to it and then mentally and, and you know, emotionally dependent on it as well. So part of it is that we have to tackle that dependency and have to make sure we get people into treatment programs because we can't, you know, legislate and lock up out of it, as he can allude to. We need to be the other side of it is to make sure we get people into treatment programs and we're really good about that so that the users are getting the resources they need. Otherwise, I think we're gonna be in trouble down the road. So that's one of the things we really wanna work on as well. So we're, we're partnering with law enforcement to identify those people and make sure we can treat them. Interim Chief Vasquez, did you wanna talk about what you're saying? Yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the operational aspects, what our officers are seeing on the streets. When you think about these type of, of drug uh, law changes or other types of law changes where we're uh, pushing crimes down into misdemeanor status, what, we're, what our officers are seeing is an arrest of somebody is uh, the same as giving them a traffic ticket. So you could have, uh, if this goes through as as currently written with the four grams being a misdemeanor, you could have enough fentanyl in your possession to kill 2,000 people and an officer's gonna write you a ticket and you're gonna walk away from, from the scene. 
And that could happen over and over and over again, week after week. Drug dealers are not stupid. They, they know they're going to pay attention to these laws. And why would they carry anything more than a misdemeanor level? Uh, they can then go back and re resupply themselves and sell more and more. And to the doctor's point, um, we are seeing that uh, users are oftentimes dealers that are just supplying other people so that they can feed their own habits. So they're making money off of the sale of those drugs so that they can go and, and purchase more drugs. And again, in quantities that we're really just going to write them a ticket if by chance we happen to come across them. So from a perspective of an officer out on the street, the frustration over uh, letting people go over and again for the same crime because we can't hold them accountable uh, is concerning. I want to switch gears just a little bit as we talk about moving forward. And, and I know that we've discussed some of the tools that are available to emergency workers, law enforcement, um, who do roll up onto the scene. Uh, let me ask both Ms. Flickendurfer and Dr. Steinbrunner, it, yeah, I think you touched on this earlier, uh, Katie. It, fentanyl addiction is not necessarily hard to treat. This is an audience question. They understood that it was difficult to help someone who is addicted. Is that not the case? No, I mean, it is difficult mm -hmm. to treat any addiction because it's changed the way their brain is operating in order to cope or manage things that they may be experiencing that are not being treated. And so you have to have other things that are replacing the reasons why they are using drugs, which is when someone's been a long time user, their body chemistry has adjusted. And so it, the harm reduction model and figuring out how do we taper them safely off of these substances with prescription drugs um, that then is managed by a doctor is so important. Um, having peer support, like I spoke to as well, and family support, a family understanding that it's not necessarily an easy journey. And it doesn't mean that somebody doesn't want to be sober. Um, it's it's challenging and people jump back to the, the substance that has um, given them relief when they have struggled before. Mm. Dr. Steinberg. I think to her earlier point, she was uh, also talking, benzo um, alcohol withdrawal can actually cause fatal seizures and delirium tremens. Opiate withdrawals causes people to be nausea and vomiting, dehydrated, and uh, central nervous system gets ramped up. But mo most of the time, it, it is not lethal. However, it can be miserable. And so that's why people keep using. Um, I mean, the sheriff's office and the police department have been very good about getting people in who are they're recognizing going through these withdrawal symptoms to see if we can treat them uh, rather than just get them uh, incarcerated because they recognize that a different pathway makes sense um, and so we can stop this revolving door. So that's been very helpful. Uh, Chief Royal, this is another audience question. We know as a firefighter you train your crew to you know be ready at any moment to respond to these types of situations. What should a family member or friend do if they suspect a fentanyl overdose? What do you train your crew to do? Well, it's a good, a good question, but for the family member or friend, it's to act quickly. Uh, so um, we talk about this uh, and we really need to get the word out because we've had situations where friends and family members have taken the overdose person, tried to give them their own antidote, whatever that might look like, or threw them in the bathtub and tried to you know shower them with cold water. It's not good. Um, they need to call as soon as they can. And as Dr. Steinbrunner had said, shared that, you know, they, they go lethargic, then they start to lose their respiratory drive. And it's that point, the sooner that we can get there, the, the higher likelihood that our uh, medications are going to help them out. Um, you know, once they get into respiratory arrest and then the cardiac arrest, the time is of, it, of the essence. We have, over uh, the last few years, uh, totally changed the amount of Narcan that we would give in overdose situations just based on fentanyl. Uh, it's way higher than what we used to give. And um, even with that, though, we may not be able to get them out of it just because of how strong and powerful this drug is. Uh, the other thing that's changed is um, all, all of our basic EMTs it used to just be a paramedic skill, but all of our basic EMTs can give Narcan now as well as police officers and sheriff's officers. And I'm glad to hear that they're looking at it in the schools, too, because the sooner that you can do that and get them back uh, breathing on their own, the, the higher opportunity is for survival. Mm -hmm. 
is Dr. Steinberg, you held up the, the Narcan naloxone there. Yes, I did. It's it, actually, is that one dose for someone? Is it multiple ones? No, it's one dose. It's, it's a nasal injection, so you don't have to think about how to get it in. When somebody comes into the emergency department, I'm an ER doc, we actually establish an IV and give it to them through the IV. But the beauty of this is that you can actually just put it in someone's nose and squirt it in there. Uh, and let's say they're not overdosing on narcotics. It's not going to hurt them. So if you don't know and you're in doubt and it looks like it might be an overdose, just do it. It's a little like when we come up on scene and uh, in Chief Royal can talk about this, um, you know, Chief Royal can talk about this. When we come up on scene and we don't know or in the ED, we don't know what's wrong with them and we think they're low on sugar, we might give them sugar if we can't test it. You know, it's not going to hurt them. So in this case, give them the Narcan and we'll just make sure and uh, do basic open airway and establish CPR if you have to do it. I think we talked about this at the beginning of the hour, too. Should everyone have that? Yeah, I think we probably should. I mean, we're facing a difficult crisis. Clearly, all of us are at the table right here because we work together with each other. We actually know each other in various capacities. It's a small community that's trying to do this for public safety, and we're all tackling it from different angles. And we all support each other trying to do that because there's no one way to establish and attack this problem, but I think the way we do it is together. And one element that we can do is to put an antidote out there that can reverse it. Now, you may have to give another dose, potentially, depending on how much they've taken. And somebody that you do suspect of having an overdose, you're saying it's it's okay to just give it to them? It is okay to give it to them. Now, if someone's sleeping and they were just trying to have a nap, you might want to talk to them first before you do that and sure. shake them. But yeah. it's been done. You know, don't start CPR when they're resting. But, it, but if you really think that someone's hurting, I mean, all jokes aside, or someone's overdose, then give them the Narcan. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And then call 911. Katie, those people that you're helping to recover from addiction, do, you, do they have this on hand? Yes, yeah, so um, we oversee at Diversus Health the MSO, which serves the indigent population for substance use, the people who lack insurance, um, and we give out Narcan. I think we've given out 600 kits so far this year of Narcan to try to save people's mm -hmm. lives. Um, I think one of the other pieces that's important to note when you think about um, what do you do for your loved ones is also how do we get upstream on this and prevent people from going to opiates? And I think one of the things that people should be aware of is looking for a change in behavior in their loved one. Um, are they behaving differently in their day to day? Are maybe they not engaging in school or with social friends that like they used to? And how do we then have a conversation so that we're looking for warning signs on the front end as opposed to just looking for warning signs after they've overdosed. Mm. And Corey, do you have these things in schools, the, the kits? Yeah, we've actually, Diverse Health has actually helped us with this. Uh, they provided training for our nurses and then our nurses are able to train additional staff. And so we have uh, ordered it from the bulk system at the state and we have um, hundreds of doses in our school, uh, primarily at the middle school and high school. DA Allen, you mentioned it during your uh, your talk a few weeks back about parents paying attention. And before we get to closing remarks, I think that might be a good way to, to wrap this up. It's, it isn't just parents, it's the entire community, right, that needs to pay attention to this and, and have these resources on hand, know where to get them. Yeah, it really is. <clears throat> and just sitting here listening to the conversation, I'm so impressed by this panel that we've put together. This is the first conversation in the state of Colorado that I'm aware of that is really addressing this issue in the way that we're talking about it tonight, uh, talking about it from the treatment side and the enforcement side and what we're seeing in the ER and in the fire, that to me is a very impressive thing. Um, but it really is about spreading that knowledge, making sure that parents and loved ones know what their family members are doing. If you're seeing stuff out in, in, in their social media about drug use, intervene, right? Be that, be that uh, loving voice that's going to step in and save somebody's life. And then the other thing that I want to really pass out to the community is pay attention to legislation that's rolling down um, from Denver. So the, the bill that's going through now, important to read that bill and, and let your legislator know what's happening with it. Uh, there was a really good piece in the Gazette from this last Sunday about the economic analysis of the fentanyl epidemic and, and can they trace it back to specific legislation. The law changed in 2019 that allowed these drugs to be a misdemeanor and that article specifically suggested that a big number, the vast majority of these deaths since that time can be directly attributed to that legislation. So legislation that's being passed in Denver is having a direct impact on our communities, the safety in our communities, and lives have been lost as a result of specific legislation. So I can't stress it enough to the community, pay attention to the legislation that's being passed by your legislators, read it, 
and then voice your opinion, make sure they know where the community stands on this. Because again, this is not a, a partisan issue. It's not about Republicans and Democrats. This is a public safety issue, purely and simply. We have a few minutes left here to do some key takeaways. I asked all of our panelists to, to maybe wrap things up in a couple of sentences. Can we start with Chief Royal? Do you have a key takeaway you want everybody to know about? I would just go back to what I was saying is call quickly. If you're in a, if you're in a situation with a loved one or a friend that's uh, been involved with this and need help, call because time is of the essence. And uh, we're on the reactive side. We're gonna go there and treat them just equally with everybody else. but. Uh, we need to get there quickly to do it. So. And Ms. Blick and Durfin. Um, I would say my takeaway is that don't assume that it's not going to impact your family and friends and get upstream by being willing to have challenging conversations. Chief Vasquez. I think I go back to education as a key. I mean, we're educating our kids in schools through SROs from the police department and through, other, through the schools themselves. Um, but education in doing things like this panel, as DA Allen mentioned, I think is critical. Uh, and then the legislative efforts also are critical that everybody would pay attention to those. Dr. Kelly. Yeah, and I started by, by talking about how this impacts us all, um, every one of us. And because it impacts all of us, all of us have a role to play in this. And I think every one of us, despite you know, the expertise sitting at this this table would uh, would unanimously agree that none of us can do this on our own. And none of us, even the collective, can't do anything without the people out there uh, in the community to, to play the role. And we've had similar challenges in the past in this community with our teen suicide epidemic. And we've come together and brought the right people to the table and got to work. Um, and we can do that here. Dr. Seinberg. I would echo the same thing that Dr. Kelly said. I've worked a shift where I've seen somebody from take it for the first time and somebody else who's a user and both of them came in nearly dead because of it, but we're able to get something to reverse it and move forward. So we're in this together. We can do this together. We have to work with each other to get there. The DA Allen. I think I've already said uh, what I want to say, but as a prosecutor, I, I always appreciate having do close first and I get to close again. So I'll, <laughs> I'll take the opportunity. Uh, get the word out. Make sure that your loved ones know the danger of fentanyl. Uh, make sure that you're seeing what this stuff looks like. It's it's looking like candy. It's looking like Percocet. And really just driving home how dangerous this stuff is and how prolific it is. Every single illicit drug on the street right now should be assumed to contain deadly dosages of fentanyl. Mr. Nutzstein. Yeah, I think no age is too early to have a conversation right now. I have an eight-year-old son, and we sat down and talked about if you find something on the playground and someone gives it to you, don't take things. So it's not about an age. We really need to be having conversations. And if you're a youth and you feel like your parents aren't someone you can go to because you're fearful that they might um, react to your use, find another trusted adult. You have a trusted adult in your life. Please seek out the help that you um, desire right now. And under Sheriff Roybal. Uh, this is the beginning of it. And I want to thank uh, Adam events for getting this important message out to the community and, and sharing our message uh, with, with this community. I think it's a three-pronged three prong approach. It's a law enforcement, it is a legislation, and it's intervention. And the intervention begins with the family. Uh, law enforcement does it, but let's continue those conversations uh, within our community, within our schools, and everybody. And, and this is a, a big step forward, so thank you. Thank you, and thank you to all the panelists uh, this evening. Would you give them a, a Round of applause, too, for their time this evening. We thank you uh, for helping us understand how it affects all of us. And I know that's really the goal here is, again, people, family, the community, to really understand the depth, the scope, and, and some potential steps forward. So thank you for being here in person to those who attended here at Centennial Hall. And then, of course, to those that are watching online, streaming this. Uh, it will be, it will live on our website and the Gazette's website, so you have the opportunity to share it with family and friends if they would like to be part of the conversation, too. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.